Good afternoon, folks, or evening, depending where you are. Welcome back to World War II TV, and we are continuing our look at naval battles. And I'm grateful that our guest today stepped into the breach because I lost a show and ended up gaining two in a weird way, one for today, an extra one on Friday. But um, what's extraordinary about this subject and extraordinary about our guest in some ways is that there's it's, it would be easier to list the things my guest hasn't done with regards to naval history that it is that he has done. I mean, you name it, he's worked there, including HMS Belfast. I had a cousin on HMS Belfast back in the 50s and 60s, and he's written about this subject, he's lectured about it, and he is joining us today. So Nick Hewitt is joining us to talk about the convoys down the east coast of England and other things about that long war, the long struggle to keep Britain's supplies going, essentially. So I'll bring him in now. So good evening, Nick Hewitt. How are you today? Hello. Yeah, good. Thank you. How are you? I'm good. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's we talked about with Brian Walter uh, yesterday about the Mediterranean and logistics. And when it comes down to the, the naval war, logistics kind of underlines everything, doesn't it? To some extent, as exciting as it is talking about capital ships and engaging capital ships and, and all the and PT boats and then it all comes down to supplies, doesn't it? It really does. But I think that's also particularly true for Britain because Britain's an island nation. So this goes, this is more than logistics. This isn't just something that, that Britain does in wartime. This is how Britain functions and Britain can't just stop doing it because there's a war on. And I think that's that's one of the, the real lessons of the coastal convoys in particular for me. No, definitely. And, and you know, we talk about the Battle of the Atlantic being... I think the most important battle of World War II getting overshadowed by perhaps the Normandy campaign or Market Garden or the, the fighting in Tobruk. Well, what we're talking about tonight is overshadowed in the shadow of that, isn't it? It's in another shadow there and yet integral to it. So I will mention again, folks, the, the, we're talking about Nick's book, um, which is uh, Coastal Convoys. I'll flash the, uh, the overlay up there. The link to the book is in the description below. You can find find it online or your usual bookseller or whoever you buy your books. So, and it's the, one of several books that Nick has penned and been involved in. So, that's the that's the plug out of the way. But I'm gonna basically hand over to you to talk about this 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 fascinating aspect and sit back and learn stuff. So, folks, if you've got questions for Nick, we can do some as we go along. If it's a little ones about detail, we'll do it as we go along. If you've got any kind of big overarching questions about the principle of convoys, perhaps we'll do them at the end. So um, I'll, I'll bring up the PowerPoint and um, hand over to Nick to control it. And we will, we will sit back and learn. So, folks, again, if you've got questions, fire away, please. Great. Thanks very much, Paul. It's really lovely to be here and uh, really enjoying just picking up this subject again as well, which is, um, you know, the, it was the first book I wrote. So it's something I, I, I did a, quite a long time ago now. I'm not going to confess how long, but um, if you look at the book, you find out easily enough. Um, and actually, the, the, the story of just two seconds on why I wrote it is a really good um, illustration of just how overlooked this story is, actually. Um, I was invited to do um, a, a contributor slot for the BBC series Coast, um, and I was asked to go down to Dover and talk about that they found some film. Um, it's a very famous bit of film of a Channel convoy being bombed as it went past the Straits of Dover, um, and they decided they were going to do one of those little four-minute Coast pieces on it. Would I come down and, and do some context? So I said yes, um, and I did what everybody does. I popped off to the library at the Imperial War Museum where I was working at the time to find a book, and it wasn't a book. <laughs> um, and I think that says it all, really. Um, I later discovered when I was doing my research, there are one or two books. There's a fabulous one that is self-published and isn't really out there in the world. There's a couple of very, very old sources that are almost primary sources more than book now they were written in the 50s by participants and that's that's about it um <clears throat> and i'll get on to when we start to talk about the, the the colliers and the convoys themselves um a little bit about why i think that is um the coastal convoys were the were the missing um the missing link in the chain really for for wartime logistic convoys for me and um I was lucky enough to work with Richard Woodman, who's written some fabulous books on, on the North Atlantic convoys, the Real Cruel Sea. He's written one about the Arctic convoys, Malta convoys. And Richard told me that he had wanted to do this story because he saw it as the kind of what happens next from the Atlantic. But his publishers wouldn't let, let him write a book that vast. So um, he was he was very, very supportive and kindly wrote my foreword for me. Um, and in a sense, that's what happens. But in a sense, it isn't. The, the point about coastal convoys is they represent 
the militarization of, of what Britain is doing anyway and has to do all the time it is the indestructible highway. Um, the, the campaign, and it is a campaign, lasts for the entire war. So the first coastal convoys are run in, you know, right at the start, September 1939, and they go right through to the end of the war. And the last two ships sunk in convoy anywhere are actually sunk on a coastal convoy around the north of Scotland on the 7th of May 1945. So the day before the war ends. So um, it really is. It's, it's an epic campaign. Um, we'll just see if I can move. There we go. Oh, no. Over enthusiastic. So why are they doing it? Well, fundamentally, um, it's mostly about coal, hence the coal miners here. Um, coastal convoys happen because of Britain's geography. Um, and it's a very, very simple. So my dad was a geographer. Um, he tried in vain to make me one. Um, but I did a little bit of digging on, on this, no pun intended, um, when I did the introduction to the book. And it's, it's pretty simple stuff. The coal is in the north of England and the south of England has a voracious appetite for it. Um, there is there is a myth that's grown up, really. It was even there during the war, and we'll get onto this later on, uh, but certainly since, that this is about bringing coal down for people to heat their houses. Um, and yes, that's part of it, but it's not just that. It's the power stations, it's sewage, it's transportation, it's anything that needs power at all is run on coal at this point in history. Um, and how do they carry that coal? They carry it in ships. So again, one of the myths, um, I'll try not to rant about Len Dayton too much, but some of the stuff that Len Dayton put in his Battle of Britain book was one of the things that really pushed me over the edge in terms of writing this one. Um, you, you can't move this stuff and put it on the railways. You can't go and put it on the roads. It would take hundreds and hundreds of trucks to carry what one coastal convoy could carry. It would take hundreds and hundreds of trains. And these trains and these trucks are being used for other purposes mm. and the railway networks and the road networks aren't up to the job. We move this stuff by sea and the, mostly it's coal, but it's other generally high volume, low value cargoes that you can chuck in a ship in the north of England and bring it round to the south. And I mean, it works yeah. in the same principle as shipping stuff by container now, isn't it? It's the stuff that it's takes up a lot of space that you, you, you've got to get somewhere, you know. Yeah, up to a point. Maybe not, the, the parallel is probably not the containers, but it's the bulk carriers. Okay, yeah. Um, and actually, you know, when I lived in Portsmouth until comparatively recently. I used to go for a walk around the harbour there, and, and there was little ships filling up with cement. So we were not moving coal around now, but the, the, the same companies are moving coal until really the country moves away from coal-fired power stations. So they're going well into the 80s and 90s, they're still shifting it, and then it sort of fades away. But now it's cement and, you know, all that kind of stuff that that's still high volume, low value, chuck it in a ship and move it. Um, it's Britain is basically designed to make this system work. It's, it's geographic. It's a geographical accident. So you've got this this huge coastline. You've got coal. It's quite a narrow country. Everything's quite near the sea. Um, I think you're only ever about 70 miles. The furthest you can be from the sea is about 72 miles or something. They used to teach us that on coast. It was like Coast 101. Um, and um, and then you've got all these wonderful navigable rivers that can take you up. So the, the classic coal route is from the northeast of England down to the Thames estuary, up the Thames, um, and then feeding the power stations on the Thames. And they designed these wonderful ships called flat iron colliers, um, where you could lower the masts and funnels so they could pass under the bridges on the Thames and, and deliver coal to the um to the to the power stations um my dad taught me this um, my dad found me some books when i was doing this um and he found me a lovely book by a bloke called professor t.s willin and he said you need to his in his book he referred to the the coastal waters as being like a river around england and that's how we use it we used it as a river and the point was you couldn't stop doing that just because there's a war on because everything grinds to a halt mm. so this was not a new problem um, and actually, just as a, an aside that I forgot to give, if you look at that picture and also the one that's on the cover of the book, um, that actually depicts a coastal convoy. That picture on the book cover has been used time and time and time again to illustrate Atlantic convoys because they're the ones that everybody thinks about and nobody thinks about these guys. So it's relatively easy so everybody thinks to protect this shipping we've done it before we did it in the first world war in the first world war the threat was u-boats and when we're talking about u-boats and shipping in the first world war we are not talking about convoys in the middle of the atlantic or off the u.s coast the u-boats don't have the range and they don't need to go that far anyway we're talking about coastal shipping 
and maybe a bit in the Western approaches. That's what they're going for. Um, by the end of the war, painfully, slowly, 1917, they learned that if you stick the ships in convoy, the U-boats have to come to the convoy and then you can attack them. And by the end of the war, they're getting technology like um, ASDIC, so um, primitive sonar for detecting submarines, depth charges for destroying them underwater. So the Admiralty comes out of the First World War thinking it has the plan. We've got the plan now to deal with U-boats. This is not a problem. As soon as the war starts, put your ships in convoy. All good. The only problem is um, that's not the threat that they're going to face in the Second World War, as we'll get on to in a bit. U-boats are a problem at the beginning, very, very early on. But U-boats get hammered in coastal waters and they rapidly learn not to play around there. So it doesn't really last very long as a threat. Just a little bit on the on the colliers. So these are interesting companies. Again, there, there is a massive difference between the, the big deep sea oceanic shipping companies and the little outfits that are often family run, um, run on a shoestring, sometimes one ship companies. Um, I came across quite a few examples of Thames sailing barges, sailing in coastal convoys. Um, they are small ships. They are deeply, deeply uncomfortable. They're not designed to be habitable. Um, their crews tend to be older. And that's why when I was researching the book, I found very, very few um, first hand accounts from actual merchant Navy crews. I found lots from naval signalers, um, you know, people who were posted on the colliers, but they weren't merchant Navy. And that's because it was a retirement job, a semi retirement job for deep water sailors. So they would do their time roaming the globe. And as they got older, they'd go on to what they used to nickname a weekly boat. Um, and that would allow them to, you know, they could go home every couple of nights and spend a night in their house before they did another trip. So tended to be older. They tended to be smaller. They tended to be less well paid. There was a survey done of various coastal shipping companies before the war and the conditions on some of them were absolutely diabolical. Um, and all the usual issues that the Royal Navy had with Merchant Navy um, in spades on the coast, um, slightly truculent merchant skippers who did not want to be shepherded around by young Royal Navy officers in, in warships, all that kind of stuff. Very, very hard system to organise. But organise it, they did. And they put in all the building blocks that probably people are familiar with in the Atlantic, but in a slightly different shape. And it's literally a shape in the case of the East Coast convoys. Because where you think of your North Atlantic convoy is a kind of classic block of multiple sort of five, six, seven, eight columns of ships. So it's like a tight box. That doesn't work on the coast because on the coast you've got a mine barrier. Literally, they sow mines all the way down the east coast of, of England at the start of the war. And the convoys run between the mines and the coast. And so they, instead of running in a block, they run in two columns generally that stretches out for miles and miles. There's 50, 60 ships was pretty normal on the coast, but there's just two lines of them. So that makes it very hard to protect uh, because there's a very thin line spread out. So just looking at, we should have a map. OK, hopefully everyone can see that. So this is the situation at the start of the war. Now, again, bear in mind, they're gearing up for a war with Germany that's going to be World War One, part two. That's what the plan is. So we've got France on our side. We've got a U-boat predominantly threat. How do we convoy shipping? Well, we do it like this. The main war channel is the East Coast. That's where it's anticipated. The action is going to be the Germans can come out from the Baltic, um, maybe some surface ship raids, but mostly U-boats. Um, you get down through the channel. And once you're through the Straits of Dover, you're in safe waters with friendly shores on both sides and a totally impenetrable mine barrier in the Straits of Dover. So nothing's going to come through. So the convoys, um, FN and FS, 4th North, very hard to say, and 4th South, very simple, um, running up and down the East Coast from the Thames Estuary to the Firth of 4th. Um, they button on and, and drop off ships on the way up. So, you know, things ships might leave and go into other coastal ports. Others might join. Um, and um, they simply number them. So it's FN1. They number them up to 100 and then they start the numbering all over again, which is an absolute nightmare for a historian. It took me ages to unpick it. Um, and eventually I, I used somebody else's numbering system to give them more unique numbers so it didn't get too confusing. Once they're, um, and these, these convoys at this stage in the war are also including oceanic shipping. So it's, it's about getting deep water ships and coasters down through that dangerous east coast into the channel. And then they just dispersed them. So they ran oceanic convoys. You can see them in there from the Thames Estuary and from Liverpool. 
outbound route A and outbound route B, OA and OB. And that was literally just to get them just outside the British Isles. And then they would disperse and they'd sail independently. So you've got the oceanic shipping going through the channel. You've got colliers and coasters going up and down the East Coast. All good. And then you've got some escorts. Uh, pretty basic, the V&W class destroyer HMS Westminster. To be honest, if you're on a coastal convoy and you've got a V&W class destroyer, which were the, the kind of workhorse destroyers um, in reserve from the First World War that were, were dragged out and used in the Second World War, you'd think you were pretty well off if you got one of these. That's quite a punchy escort. Um, so that's a you know an old fleet destroyer, um, probably with some additional anti-aircraft armament. At best, you would have one of those if you were lucky on a, on a coastal convoy. Probably not much else. Um, and then and just, if I, if I, I'm going to jump in with a couple of questions one yeah. from me and then we've got a few coming in online that you may or may not be covering up later on but one is I can't see them actually no I'll, I'll put them up on the screen in a minute but when, oh, when yeah. we're talking about that late 1930s period we know that you know think the people are thinking about the home defense and radar they're thinking about what we'll need in terms of tanks what we'll need in terms of this that and the other had there been any kind of calculations done about the fact that if war comes, factories in the South will be working at greater capacity, there'd be more need for coal, more need for, the, need for this, that and the other, and they would have to in increase this system? Or was it all just kind of reacting to the situation around it? Was it planning or reacting? I suppose is my question. So, well, it's a bit of both, really. It's quite interesting. The fact the factories aren't, the, the factories still aren't in the South, mainly, um, mm. but you have got power stations running at full tilt in the south. So at, at the very least, they know they're going to have to keep the same rate up all right. the way through the war. And they're going to have, you know, that, that's going to have to be done in war conditions. Um, when it comes to preparations, they know they're going to convoy. When it comes to escorts, they, they have a plan. The, the plan isn't that obviously Britain's very late to rearm. And we all know that story about it's kind of the late 30s before they start taking this, this stuff seriously. That they do work on the basis that the large, complicated warships take longer to build, so that's what we should focus on, and that small escort craft can be knocked out quicker, so in a sense you can do those at, at the last minute. Um, the problem is the last minute passes, and it's not that they haven't built any, but they get repurposed, so that the, flower, the famous flower-class corvettes, we all know the flower-class corvettes, you know, the, 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 the uh, Cruel Sea, all that kind of stuff, Compass Rose, fantastic little ships they're designed as a coastal escort that's what they're supposed to be there for they're supposed to do this job the problem is the situation in the atlantic gets so desperate that the flower class corvettes are taken away and put in the atlantic and you very rarely see them on the coast again um so the, nothing's in the right place they, they don't get the war that they've planned for is essentially the problem Okay, and they'll do a couple of questions from viewers and we'll get back to the yeah, yeah, of course. So yeah. david k is saying for the convoy ships, to the extent that the ships were not owned by the government, were the ship owners compensated for their use or loss if sunk? So that's interesting. That that evolves over time. So at the start of the war, certainly not. Um, they are um, they're insured, but then they can't get insurance. Um, pretty early on, they're taken over by the Ministry of War Transport, and so they become they effectively become state assets. That the, there's a little bit of a myth, really, an understandable one that was built up in wartime that. That the merchant navy is the fourth service and you know it has this this weight that is equivalent to the the other services and all the rest of it that that simply doesn't reflect the reality of, of the merchant navy um the merchant navy evolves incrementally over time during the war eventually it does have that level of respect and protection at the beginning it doesn't at the start of the war these are private ships operated by private businesses run by civilians that you know civilian crews um, and very famously until, until I can't remember the precise date, but it's, it's at least two years into the war. I think it might be 1942, actually. Merchant sailors pay stops when their ship's sunk. You know, I mean, which is shocking when you look back on it now, but that's it. As soon as the ship goes down, they're not being paid until they get another ship. And that's why you get these horror stories of, of blokes who've done three months in an open boat in the Atlantic and they're, they're back at sea again within a couple of weeks because they can't afford not to be. So it, it, at the beginning, these are private ships run by individual businesses. Um, and there's all the usual reluctance that, you know, that they don't really want to be in convoy. It mucks up their schedules. You know, it, it affects their profit margins. They don't, merchant sailors don't like steaming in the same space as other merchant sailors because they're worried they'll clash into it. The difference in the First World War is they, they grip that very early and they, 
they, they basically put them under under wartime regulations they tell them what they're going to have to do so to that extent it's a bit different okay well i think that then the next question was about pay so you've kind of covered pay and again it's an evolving situation it would have to kind of look at it at which point of the war we're talking about i suppose and uh, but we'll, we'll we'll hand back and then we'll we'll i love the questions folks keep them coming but yeah, um, I'll hand back to to carry on and it's it's good good stuff so uh, back to you uh, yeah, very touching on pay. It is a difficult pay varies in t- enormously from company to company at the start of the war. So these things do get standardized over time and they do get that. But at the beginning, you know, if you're on a, a Thames barge run by a family company, you're not going to earn. We, we probably it's probably your ship. You know, you're mm. on it. That's it. Some of the companies were a little bit bigger and, and they were running multiple ships and they had more standardized rates of pay. But broadly, no one on a collier is going to get what you would have got on a deep water freighter. OK, that's for sure. Um, and then similarly, sliding effortlessly onto this this slide, um, it's also true of the escorts. So, um, so these are these are the mainstay on the coast. Um, the Royal Naval Patrol Service. So this is um, it's been nicknamed Churchill's Pirates, been nicknamed Dad's Navy, all sorts of things. Um, these are trawler men in trawlers, basically. Um, and again, this is a system that has evolved in the First World War and works very well, and they've honed it down. So this is one of those building blocks that they just get out. As soon as the war starts, this is what you do. The Navy sweeps up a lot of trawlers. There are a small number that are admiralty built trawlers. So they're built as small warships, but they hoover up huge numbers of trawlers and drifters from civilian trade, um, including, um, you know, we've just come out of the depression, don't forget. So there's quite a lot mm. of these things are laid up anyway. Um, they also hoover up the crews, the fishermen who are mostly naval reservists. Um, a large number of them get swept into the Royal Naval Patrol Service. They go to um, Lowestoft, where there is a camp um, in a former holiday camp called Sparrow's Nest. They do a few weeks of basic training, and then they pretty much go back to a trawler. Um, and they're either doing anti-submarine work or they're doing mine sweeping. Most of them are doing mine sweeping. And actually, the techniques for, for what was called Oropisa sweeping, which is basically where, you, where you've got a moored mine tethered to the seabed and you cut a wire, very, very similar to trawling. So, you know, this is very familiar stuff to them. They've just got a uniform on, and actually most of them don't even bother with that. And you get a few younger specialists added to the crew, so you'll get some signal. The Admiral team will provide some signalers, some gunners, maybe. Um, the officers generally were um, merchant navy fishing skippers, and actually there's a real snobbery to it. Um, the captains of these things were often known as skippers or skipper lieutenant um you know they, they they didn't have the same status as a, a a royal naval officer of the same rank or even a, an rnbr officer of the same rank very much an improvised ersatz escort force and you can see i forgot to note the name of this one actually but if, if you look at this trawler you get a real sense of you know there's a fishing boat there with some incredibly unstable and uncomfortable gun tubs added aft they would squeeze on depth charges. They would squeeze on, um, you know, extra anti-submarine gear, extra sweeping gear. You can see the sort of uncomfortable looking four inch gun balanced on the platform up forward. A lot of them were a lot smaller than this. This is, is quite a big one. Um, so you might get, again, in an average coastal convoy, let's say you've got one of those smart looking BMW class destroyers. You might have a couple of sweepers um, up forward. So leading the way because the worry is that you're going to get airdrop mines in front of you as you're going up the war channel. Um, you might have another couple of trawlers or drifters running kind of running escort, running interference really down the sides. Um, so that's th- this escort slowly building up. Trawlers and old warships is what it starts with. And somehow you've got to you've got to have some sort of discipline to this. So they, they run exactly the same system as they do on every other convoy route. There is a, a whole process that they know how to do here. It's really interesting, and it's another one of those understudied um, areas, actually. There is a, one good book on it that I know of, but is, is this um, uh, structure of the convoy commodores. So the, the convoy commodores are always, without fail, retired, elderly retired, either naval officers or merchant navy officers um, who are brought out of retirement and they are given the, the honorary rank of Commodore, Commodore R&R, um, all of them, whether they were a, a rear admiral in the Royal Navy in 1918, they're all Commodores. Um, on the coast, they tended to be retired, more junior officers. So you find a lot of dugout commanders, mm-hmm. lieutenant commanders um, on the East Coast. But again, elderly, elderly naval officers. 
Um, and their job, God help them, is to, to try and shepherd the merchant skippers and um, instill some sort of discipline and structure on the way they steam. So they're constantly trying to get them to keep up or slow down and generally make less smoke, which is the, the, the cry that goes out from convoy commodores throughout. They would put them on the ship for the convoy, usually one of the better ones with enough space. They'd have a small staff, mostly signalers. Um, and that would be their job. And they would join a convoy at one end. They'd get off it at the other. They'd pick up a ship and go back the other way. Um, and again, you know, hugely important role, very undersung, very difficult job, actually. And then you also get this stuff. So you get this wonderful system now called um, DEMS, the Defensively Equipped Merchant Ship Organization. Um, so this is about putting defensive armament on merchant ships so they can protect themselves. And again, if you, there is some awareness of aircraft, but a lot of this is still directed against U-boats. Um, it's very, very interesting and amusing and a little bit anachronistic, actually, the, the, the whole concept of defensively equipped merchant ships. What defines a defensive gun? Well, anti-aircraft counts as defensive. That's fine. You're all right with those, except they haven't got the anti-aircraft guns. So we'll get on to that in a minute um surface mounted um, surface firing weapons well it's defensive if it's on the back so right. you can have a three inch gun on the stern because you're firing that when you're running away but you can't have a three inch gun on the bows so it's all a bit of a nonsense really and and it reflects an earlier age you know but useful um useful for two reasons partly because it allows you to shoot back though the, the deck guns less so the aa guns very useful but also it made them feel better. There was, yeah. It really did morale. genuinely have an effect on morale to have a gun on the ship. You just felt less helpless. The problem was they didn't have enough of them. So they were digging out ancient weapons from the First World War. They were digging out, there's lots of accounts of Japanese guns that were in store somewhere back from when Britain and Japan were allied. Um, and just see the question come up there, Dems gunner with six maritime regiment, Royal Artillery, yeah. So, so the, the gunners, um, I'm not surprised he was sunk three times because these guys just used to have to move from ship to ship. Um, and there was a particular group who later, slightly later in the war, um, were operating in the channel called the Channel Guard. And they just used to carry Lewis guns from ship to ship and they never stopped. They'd get off one and on the other. Um, answer to that question, no, merchant aircraft carriers are a different animal. So they are they are a merchant ship with a flight deck and um, they the, the ship is driven by the merchant navy. It's the aviation personnel on it that are fleet air arm personnel. Um, the the Dems gunners often they would only get one or two, so the entire gun crew isn't military or naval. Um, and some some of them are naval reservists, and some of them are later from the maritime regiment Royal Artillery. So they're, they're army gunners. Um, usually, what their job is is to lead and train merchant navy crew volunteer crew. Um, and the Merchant Navy gunners got some ridiculous sum of money, I can't remember what now, maybe a shilling or something, to, to operate as, as part of the gun crew, which meant they couldn't go and hide when the ship was being attacked. Um, so that's what you get. The problem is, what you haven't got is enough modern armament, and that's particularly true of anti-aircraft armament. So things like the Bofors and the Ehrlichan guns are coming into service. There's very, very few of them. The Navy are hoovering them up. So at the start of the war, you get a raft of appalling improvised weapons. Um, parachute and cable is one of my favourites. Basically, it's a a rocket like a, like a um, like a firework rocket that flies fires up, and then you get um, a parachute parachutes down with a cable dangling dangling from it. And your hope is that the the cable will you know dive bomber will fly into the cable, and a grenade is supposed to swing back into the dive bomber. It's, it's ludicrous. As is this thing that the um, the Wren on screen is demonstrating. This is a delightful device called a Holman projector. So this was a steam powered grenade launcher. So you bolted it to the tech you, to the deck and you plugged it into the ship's um, steam pipes. And the idea is you use the steam pressure to fire a Mills bomb at a dive bomber, which is optimistic in the extreme. Um, even more so when you um, read that the connections were not that reliable and there were numerous occasions of the grenade just plopping out the end there um, and, and having to be kicked off the deck pretty sharpish. So it's, it's all a bit lashed up. Um, I think it, with your question earlier, Paul, this is one of the areas where actually you think they probably should have done better here. They should have been ordering mm. this stuff and storing it and not worrying about maybe what ship it was going to go on. But if you'd had a warehouse full of Ehrlichans from the Swiss, or even just, you know, old three pounders, 
I think they could have probably done better. Um, that, and, that image there is is suggesting a, a lost dad's army episode about you know I, I'm picturing Mannering coming in with this device and explaining it to yeah. Corporal Jones. It's it's got that kind of comedy value to it, isn't it? I mean, it's it, it absolutely does, and it gets more comedy value when you um, when you realise that but they used to mount them on coastal forces craft as well on motor torpedo boats and motor gunboats where they were rapidly seen as completely useless, and they used to fire potatoes at each other in harbour with them. That's all they did. They used to have. Wow potato jewels in harbour um, and before and I'm, just, I move, I'm just mentioning one question before it gets this appears yeah. too far to the side but i guess you're going to get to this at some point anyway it's from the great dominion about it's about magnetic wiping i'm going to get to that i'm going to get to were, that. So, yeah 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 all right so we'll uh, we'll just we'll just head that off and we'll wait for it to come <laughs> all right it's not long in fact it's probably the next but one slide um and and not forgetting the wrens either um i picked this picture for a reason um as with almost anything else connected to the Navy in the Second World War, wrens don't go to sea, but they do everything else. Um, and they are hugely important in, in the structure of coastal convoys. Um, you will find a, a, an op port operating system in every single harbour, again run by usually elderly retired naval officers, and their staff are almost entirely comprised of wrens. So they're doing all the ship movements, they're doing a lot of the signals, they're doing all sorts of incredibly important work. Um, so a, a real, real sort of important. And again, that building block, you know, we don't have women in the service and then suddenly we need them and we do. And that the Wrens expand dramatically in, in the Second World War. Yeah. So moving on, um, just just for laughs, really, um, that the Royal Air Force in terms of coastal command and its protection of, of maritime trade is, uh, I'm sure, being covered by some of your films before. It's, it's, it's the yep. story in really the Atlantic. Way. Um, it is a problem on the coast as well. And as with everything else to do with the coast, it is even more of a Cinderella service in the coast um, than it is in the Atlantic. So they're flying these things, Avro Ansons, really just training aircraft by that point. If you had an Anson over top, um, it's great in that, again, submarines tend to be wary of aircraft. So any aircraft will make a submarine dive. They can't carry a bomb big enough to do any harm to it. They're too slow and too vulnerable to fight anything else. But the Anson isn't the worst thing that they've got. And I'm just going to read a, a quote from the book, actually, which I found. And it, it just made me laugh so much. This was um, uh, the Air Ministry produced a little book about Coastal Command in 1943. It was one of those propaganda books. It's fabulous. Um, and um, there is a, a, a little account of a Coastal Command patrol in 1939. Um, and um, the aircraft concerned are Tiger Moth training aircraft. So they've they've pressed tiger moths into service um, with no meaningful ability to carry any kind of bomb load whatsoever. Um, the anonymous pilot left this little very, very brief bit here, left patrol area on account of deteriorating weather conditions. Contents of the bottom of the pigeon's basket were flown back into the cockpit, affecting eyes. So um, you've got a tiger moth without a radio that's supposed to sight a U-boat, drop a 25 pound bomb on it, and then throw a pigeon in the air to report the sighting. So the Air Force is an irrelevance as far as coastal trade is concerned in 1939-40. It's just, it's not able to do anything. All of this is a bit of a nonsense anyway, because this whole structure has been geared, as I said earlier, around U-boats. And that is not the problem that they face at the start of the war. The first problem that they face, and this is where we get onto magnetic mines, is the German magnetic mine offensive. Um, the magnetic mine is not Hitler's secret weapon. Both sides have played around with magnetic mines at the end of the First World War. Um, the Germans have developed one that actually works. Um, and it's absolutely devastating at the start of the war. There's no other word for it because there's no... Um, there's no allied mechanism for sweeping it, and that's that's the main problem. They get one fairly quickly, and we'll get onto that in a minute. But at the start of the war, um, they don't really know what they're facing. Ships are blowing up all around the coast. Um, it's an influence mine. So the mine warfare, as I said earlier, was mostly around contact mines. So your classic child's drawing of a mine with horns on that sits just below the surface of the water. It's connected to a weight that holds it to the bottom. The ship has to physically bump into it, and the explosion blows a hole in the hull. Magnetic mines are influence mines, and apologies to those who, who know this, but some people always, I always found, don't. So it sits on the seabed. You lay them in shallow water, usually delivered by aircraft, but also by submarines and, and surface ships. 
Um, and it responds to the change in the Earth's magnetic field caused by a big lump of steel, i.e. a ship, passing overhead. So it doesn't make any physical contact with the hull of the ship. What it does is it goes off with an almighty bang, and it's the shock wave and the pressure wave that does that damage. Um, so as you said earlier, I, I worked on board HMS Belfast. She was one of the earliest victims of a German magnetic mine in 1939. She ran straight over it. Now, she is a warship, an armoured warship designed to take punishment, um, and it pretty much broke her back. It um, They just about got her into harbour. Um, it was touch and go whether they were going to keep her or not because she was so badly damaged. Everything was wrecked. The engines were shifted off their, off their seats. The turrets were dislodged. Everything from that to the, you know, the war group, war in China. Um, and she was out of service until 1943. So, no, 42. So that, that's, and that's a warship. So you can imagine the impact on a, on a flimsy merchant ship that isn't designed to take this kind of punishment. So the mining offensive starts pretty much immediately. It runs the, all the way through the winter. Terracuni Maru, Japan, obviously neutral at this point in the war. She's a big Japanese cargo liner. She's mined in the Thames estuary. There are very, very few photographs of mining victims. I don't know whether this is that they're, they're censored. Um, sailors coming in and out of the Thames estuary refer to a sea of masts in the Thames estuary. Um, I'd love to see a photo of that because I've never seen one. Um, between September 39 and May 1940, 114 ships are lost to magnetic mines around the coast. Um, and it's a rate, a rate of attrition that they just can't, they can't swallow. Um, they just can't keep this loss rate up. Fortunately, it's not as, devastate, as devastating as it should have been because the Germans have misplayed their hand really, really badly with this weapon. Um, they don't have that many. Their stockpiles are not that big at the start of the war. They start using them when they haven't got enough to be truly devastating. If they were able to seed every single major river estuary with large numbers of these, they could have shut down trade not just coastal trade, actually, um, but they didn't. So they can only hit one place at a time. Um, and when you start using a weapon, it's always the biggest problem with any piece of technology. You want to use it because you want that advantage, but then you run the risk of, of somebody finding it um, and somebody uh, figuring out how it works. And that is precisely what happens. Um, the Germans drop two magnetic mines on the mudflats um, in the Thames estuary where they are in um, exposed at low water. They are recovered by a remarkable chap called Lieutenant Commander John Ouvry, who um, there is a, an IWM oral history of his account. It's quite incredible. Um, uh, there's two of them in the team. One goes out and takes the thing apart and he has to um, uh, describe over a telephone everything he's doing. So if he gets blown up, the other guy knows exactly how far he can go before he has to start worrying. Um, and um, once they figured it out, then it becomes relatively easy to work out what the countermeasures are. Um, the, the countermeasures for most of the ships is exactly what uh, the questioner said earlier. So that's degaussing. Um, so the, um, the magnetic mines are geared up for um, the, basically the North Pole. Magnetism changes depending on which side of the globe you are. If you reverse the magnetism of a ship, then you render it harmless to um, the early types of magnetic mines, at least. Um, and that's precisely what they do. They either do it in two ways. They can either do a sort of temporary fix on what they call the degaussing range. So the ship would steam very slowly through a kind of um, like a like a girder effect structure, and that would wipe the ship and, and demagnetize it for a while. Um, or you could have degaussing cables, which is a kind of more permanent system, and that they literally are wrapping electromagnetic cables around the ship and degaussing the hull. Um, so the countermeasures don't entirely shut down the magnetic mine offensive, but it stops being the, the truly devastating issue that it um, it is at the start. They also come up with some other ideas. Oh, that's one of them gone too fast. Um, so th this is a Vickers Wellington bomber modified with a sort of electromagnetic coil that can fly, fly very slowly over water and, and trigger magnetic mines off. So um, problem with that one is it's a waste of a bomber and bombers are in short supply and all that kind of thing, but it does mm. work and they do have a number of them. And the other one is this one, one of the more unfortunate warships to serve on in the Royal Navy, HMS Board. She is a converted merchant ship um, and she is basically a mine destructor ship. That's her job. So she has a, a strengthened hull um, and her job is to go around setting off uh, magnetic mines, which she does do. Um, but again, it, the impact on the ship every time one goes off is absolutely devastating, but she doesn't sink. 
So that's the countermeasures, really. Um, and the other thing they do, which I don't have a photograph of, is um, they introduce um, a sweeping system. It's all very crude stuff. It's very Heath Robinson. Um, so that the sweepers would basically tow a wooden skid, because obviously a metal, um, you, you need wooden trawlers for this, you need wooden ships for mine sweeping generally. Um, you tow a wooden skid at a safe distance behind you with an electromagnet on it, and the, the skid triggers the mine, the equipment is lost, but the mine sweeper isn't lost, and that's another mine gone. So these various methods, they, they start to get to grips with the magnetic mine offensive. That takes them all the way through the winter. Um, and just as they're starting to get to grips with that, the war changes shape completely irrevocably. And it's a very different war around the coast from this point onwards. Um, first, you get the campaign in Norway, then France falls. Um, I put this in just as a reminder, really, that one of the many places where coasters are forgotten is Dunkirk. Um, Dunkirk is not just about little ships. Coasters go to Dunkirk and participate in the Dunkirk evacuation as they do later in D-Day, which we'll get onto in a bit. Um, after Dunkirk, the war has changed. And the big thing that's changed is that lovely safe bit of water with a friendly shore on each side, the English Channel, is no longer safe. Um, and this is enormously problematic for the coastal convoys. Um, and what it also introduces is a whole new range of threats, firstly from the air. Um, the, Prior to the fall of France, the Luftwaffe had a fairly limited ability to interfere with coastal shipping. Um, this aircraft like this, the JU-87 Stuka dive bomber, they couldn't reach that far. So you get some tip and run raids from um, Heinkel 115 seaplanes and that kind of thing, relatively long range maritime patrol aircraft. But there isn't a lot of air action. Um, after the fall of France, when the Luftwaffe moves to the coast of France, um, then it becomes a very different ballgame altogether. Um, and in fact, the first phase of, um, of the Battle of Britain, known as the Canal Camp for the Battle for the Channel, is all about the coastal convoys. And this was the point where I, I just started to lose the plot with Len Dayton, because it, it, he literally writes in his book that, that, that the RAF was running, that the convoys were being run to, to, to bait out the Luftwaffe so that the RAF could go and shoot them down over water. And it, it's so wrong and such a profound misunderstanding of, of why these things are running. They're running because Britain grinds to a halt without coal. Mm. And you can't stop running coal to the south coast. You've already lost the east coast ports because they're incredibly vulnerable now. You, you can't give up on the entire south coast as well. So you've got to keep going. You have to run these things in. They stop running oceanic shipping. We'll get onto that in a minute. But but the coastal shipping has to keep going. I, I, I'm just thinking I, I, about at one point I've had it on my list about doing a show specifically about the influence of Len Dayton's Battle of Britain book because <laughs> it, it, it I have it. I've still got a copy of it, and it 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 was when it came out because it was a combination of text and pictures and graphs. And yeah. Everybody had it, and I've still, yeah. said, I've still got a copy of it. And it's one of those texts I think. Max Hastings' Overlord will be up there as another book that was very, very influential when it came yeah. out and steered the understanding of history a particular direction and perhaps a wrong direction for a long, long time. The influences of it are still being felt, I think. It's, I uh, think you're absolutely it's right. And I think it's, uh, all those kind of texts of that type, I think it's it's interesting and they're of their type. I'm, I'm reading one at the moment, Normandy 44, Invasion 44 is another one. It's, you know, it's, it's of its time. 1959 so i mean you know dayton was a novelist he had a particular story to tell he wanted to tell history in a, in a way that made it as kind of engaging and exciting and page turning as a novel um and i think that's that's a big part of what he was doing um he, i mean he wrote bomber command as well didn't he I, 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 not my area so i don't really know the accuracy or otherwise of it but i think but but the other thing in, in his defense i guess is that the, the whole importance of coastal trade is so badly understood which is why i wrote my book it, it's just not understood well i think part of that and i'm going to jump in is is that mm. i'm thinking of that kind of analogy of of the people looking at the german army in 1943 and 44 by the pictures of of, of dozens of panther tanks rolling along in yeah. lines uh, is that the image a lot of people have of the royal navy in 1939-40 is is the capital ships it's the bit it's the yeah. it's the big ships coming down the slipways and, and we don't realize that the other end of the navy is is what they're I don't want to use the word cobbling together, but it kind of cobbling together is kind of how they are creating these convoys. It's it's very much the 
the the unpublicized side of side of just how, as you said, how Heath Robinson it it, it all is, and the the defense of it, the that, you know the steam powered potato lobber. Well, I mean, yeah, and the whole bizarre, the whole war it? is like that. And I think you're right that the German parallel is interesting because obviously the Germans are moving half their stuff with horses. Horses, you know, exactly. Yeah, it, it is all cobbled together. Everybody's cobbling it together. It's the same reason you know that you know if you look at what the Russians are doing. That it's not all T 34s There's all sorts of weird stuff going on in the background, um, and that's just the same as at C. Um, I think that the difference is, though, you, you don't have that battle fleet. You know, there isn't a battle fleet action, really, in the same way that there is in the First World War and the anticipation of that. There, there, there's a recognition on the part of the service in the Second World War that this is the real war. It's it's trade protection and amphibiosity are, are the real war for the Navy, and they know that. Whereas in the First World War, they're kind of doing it grudgingly, thinking at some point we'll get to the real thing. You know, we'll, we'll have the proper mm. battle. And then Jutland happens and they think we'll have another one. And actually that they don't realise that trade protection and to a small extent, but still amphibiosity is the real thing. In the Second World War, they know. So so you get you get good officers, you get good ships when they can spare them. You know, actually the amphibiosity thing is even more interesting because those big capital ships end up getting used to support amphibious landings. That's their, yeah. probably their most significant role. So th there's a recognition that the Navy... Um, that, that this is what the navy should be doing but it they don't anticipate the fall of france and i think that i think not enough has been done on really that our, that our entire war effort was oriented around you'll have a french ally alongside and it'll be like the first world war all over again with more aircraft and more tanks that's that's what they think is going to happen in the sea war i think they think it'll be pretty much the same but we need to worry about submarines whereas we had to discover submarines in the first world war it's a completely different war when that coast becomes hostile. Mm. Well, good. And the other threat that arrives just in passing at this stage, but we will get onto it more later, is the famous e-boat. Um, so the Germans have these uh, Schnellboot fast boats, German motor torpedo boats, um, nicknamed e-boats by the British. Um, uh, literally stands for enemy boat. That's why they call them that. Um, the e-boat flotillas, there aren't terribly many of them. The Germans never have very many. Boat for boat, though, they are vastly superior to anything that the Royal Navy puts out. And I, I'm not one of those people who always thinks German kit is superior, um, quite the reverse in most cases. But actually, the e-boat was an extraordinary thing. It had diesel engines. It was steel. It was bigger. It could carry a heavier payload. It was beautifully engineered. It was incredibly seaworthy. As with any German kit, though, because it was so over-engineered, they never had enough of them. Um, but the e-boat flotillas start to arrive um, in the Dutch coast, um, you know, after the fall of France and the fall of the West, you get e-boat flotillas that are, are moved around like chess pieces because there are never enough of them. So, so they arrive. They're mostly based in um, a place in the north of Holland, I can never say, Eimuiden, I think it is, um, is, is the uh, principal base, but they, they operate out of all sorts of places. There aren't very many in 1940, but they are there and they start to make their presence felt. Um, and the first place that happens, so this is basically, um, I've jumped too far, actually, I've jumped too far on that. Let's just finish off with, um, we're going to move on to a convoy called OA-178. If you recall back to the, the first map, you had those outbound oceanic convoys, the bigger ships, OA and OB, um, one going out the channel and one going out the Irish Sea, basically to disperse in the Atlantic. So they're still running these after France falls because the world has changed and they're slow to recognize it. This is a matter of days. Um, OA-178 is one of these big convoys. It goes out through the channel to go and disperse. And it's the first convoy that gets really hammered by the, the new world order. Um, it's attacked from the air by German aircraft operating out of what are still pretty improvised French bases at that stage. Um, as twilight falls, they're attacked by e-boats. Um, the convoy breaks up. Some of them um, go into Portland. Um, a lot of people will know the story of, of Jack Mantle, the Victoria Cross um, uh, Award uh, posthumous, serving on the anti-aircraft cruiser foil bank in Portland Harbour. She gets involved because the, the convoy comes in and foil bank sitting in there and provides protection. Um, they bomb the hell out of this convoy. Um, interestingly, just a little note on statistics, the, the Luftwaffe is not terribly good at hitting ships at this stage. That's a skill that the Luftwaffe has to learn. And there's a lot made of how good they are. They're pretty good off Dunkirk when things aren't moving 
or they're steaming in very confined waters like a Norwegian fjord, they can do it. Actually hitting something in open water that's going full speed and in the case of a warship maneuvering, they're not very good at it. The Stuka pilots have been trained as flying artillery for the army, not, not hitting ships underway. So OA-178 has 53 ships, um, five are sunk, 11 are damaged badly enough that they have to go back. Um, you might think that's not that bad, but actually in 1940, at that point in the war, Britain only has 3,000 cargo ships and 1,000 coasters registered UK. Mm. So actually they can't sustain that loss rate. O OA and OB convoys are going out two or three a week. You can't sustain five ships sunk and 11 damaged every single convoy. And there's very little stopping the Stukas from hitting them. So um, that's enough to close the channel to oceanic shipping. That's the end of the OBs and the OAs. Um, they, they can't take those loss rates. Uh, we're a long, long way away from you know the, the days of Americans churning out Liberty ships in, in phenomenal, phenomenally quick times. It takes months and months to build a replacement ship. So that's it. Um, the oceanic shipping no longer goes from the East Coast. It no longer goes from the Port of London and it no longer goes from the South Coast. And that's when Liverpool and Glasgow and the West Coast ports become the, the real hubs for, for transatlantic trade convoys. The big ships are no longer using the channel. But the poor old coasters still have to because they're not going out across the Atlantic. They've got to deliver their cargoes to the South Coast ports. Mm. So they are still going. Um, and what you get then is a new range of convoys, um, which you can see on here. So this is the system as it kicks in after the fall of France. So you've got um, CW and CE, so channel westbound and channel eastbound. Um, and then you've got, uh, I think it's WP and PW, which is that, the, the, I'm trying to read my own slide and I can't read it, the Irish Sea routes anyway. So what you get is a fairly complex interlocking convoy system now where you've got one route down the East Coast, one route through the Channel, one up the Irish Sea and one north about around the north of Scotland. Um, and they will they will never be out of convoy in those waters. They will they will go in a convoy, they will button onto one convoy, they'll come off it, they'll join another one. Um, this is when you get the, the Channel Guard that I was talking about earlier. Um, a lot of Canadians in the Channel Guard, Canadian reservists who they haven't got ships for. Um, so they, they form these small teams of Lewis gunners and they will get on a, a ship in the, in the Thames estuary. They will ride it to wherever it's going, usually in South Wales, and then they'll jump off and they'll get straight on another ship going back the other way. Or if there isn't one, they'll get on a train and they'll go overnight by train back to London and they'll come back again and do it all over again. So that's fairly, fairly horrific. Um, so the, the, they're anticipating now that they will have to fight these things through. Um, and for a while there in the summer of 1940, all the channel convoys become a battle basically certainly in that canal camp period um very rapidly that happens on this one richard urich who um looking at the what's going on in in the painting i'm 99 sure that he is painting the events that i'm describing which is convoy cw8 so channel westbound eight um codename peewit um, again this is one of those things that military people do to bewilder historians um, there were loads of peewits. I think every single one was called peewit. Um, uh, so this one was CW8 on the 25th of July. So not that long after OA178. Um, they basically shut down the channel for a few days, recreate this new system and then start running the channel convoys. And CW8 gets absolutely hammered on Black Thursday. This is the, the channel convoys um, PQ17 moment, really. Mm -hmm. um, there are 21 ships in the convoy. Um, only eight of them get through. Most of the rest of them are sunk. Some of them are damaged. And just for good measure, the two older destroyers that are forming the escort are also so badly damaged, they have to be towed into Dover and they're nearly lost. So um, it's the same pattern as OA-178. It's Stukas and air attack in the day. And as dusk falls, the E-boats come in um, and, and they're absolutely shattered by it. Uh, this is a photo of Summity. Summity is... Interesting because she's the CW8 oh. ship. She goes aground on Shakespeare Cliffs um, near Dover to avoid sinking. Um, but also give you a sense of this is what a typical channel coaster looks like. They're tiny little ships. They're very small. She's under 500 tonnes. Um, she, believe it or not, actually survives this experience. She is refloated, repaired, and she's still there. She's in Normandy, um, interestingly. So... Um, and also she is operated by FT Everard, so my favorite um, channel um, coasting company, or just general coasting company. 
Um, they're still, or they were still going until the early 2000s, FT Everards. Every single one of their ships ended in Itty. Um, and the last one I found was that they were launching a ship called the Speciality in the early 2000s. So, yeah, lovely continuity there, which proves that point again. There's a lot of things that Britain stops doing at sea, but you can't stop doing this stuff. You still have to move mm. things around the coast. So you get a whole new raft of building blocks now to protect the coastal convoys against what is a whole new series of threats. You get balloon ships. These are quite interesting. Um, these are operated by the Royal Navy. They are converted merchant ships mostly. Um, and they um, have uh, Royal Air Force personnel on board operating barrage balloons, which actually are a great deterrent against dive bombers. So this is purely targeted at the Stukas. Um, and then later, over time, they reach a point where every single ship is flying a barrage balloon. Um, and, you, you know, you can see these, these photographs of the convoys. With it. Uh, you see it at D-Day as well. They're still doing it at D-Day. Every ship's flying a balloon. Um, but initially, as, as um, somebody said there, one of the naval officers said this potentially tricky arrangement with dual command and all the rest of it. But it works very well. That's great. You've got balloon ships. Slightly less effective. Uh, actually, no, sorry. Wrong slide. Slightly more effective. These ships start to come into service. These are the Hunt class escort destroyers. Now, these are fabulous, absolutely brilliant, modern, <clears throat> cheap. The Americans would have called them destroyer escorts. They're kind of small, small destroyers. Um, now, they are available because they are actually, bizarrely, a bit of a design flaw. They're, they're conceived as an Atlantic escort, but they haven't got the legs. They can't, they, they haven't got the speed, uh, sorry, the, the um, endurance to cross the Atlantic. So they get used in all sorts of other ways. They turn up in the Mediterranean a lot and they're used as coastal escorts because they're, they're short journeys, but they're well armed. They're um, relatively quick. They are modern, versatile, absolutely fantastic coastal escorts. So you've got this interesting situation where the flower class Corvette, which is designed for the coast, goes out to the Atlantic because actually it's such a basic ship. It can chug across and it doesn't need to be fast. But it only needs to be as fast as the merchant ships that it's carrying or a U-boat. Whereas these, which are designed as escort destroyers for other other places, they end up on the coast and they're incredibly useful. But again, you'd be lucky if you got one. The, uh, the, the escort lead might well be the senior officer escort, probably in a hunt. Um, uh, off the top of my head, George, I'm very sorry. I don't know. Um, I can check that for you. Um, but right now, I don't know. Okay. And I've just got a question for you that, that yeah. sounds sounds a simple one. And it's... Do the Germans know what they're doing? And what I mean by that is the the, the you know the changing of they can't use the eastern ports, things like that. Is there any have they an, uh, done any analysis about how they can hit us? And you know if they hit the Atlantic convoys, it might reduce our um, food by this X and Y. Or is it all kind no, of opportunist? That's kind a of very simple question. Women? No, they haven't. Um, <laughs> not on the coast. So so. Admiral Dönitz has done his homework with the Atlantic convoys, and he's, there's, you know, he's done that calculation famously about how many, the tonnage war and how many ships they need to sink and how many tons of cargo in order to, to bring Britain to a halt. On the coast, it's more ad hoc, um, and you've got this, the, all the problems that that uh, the, the Germans face in all sorts of other theatres of war here in Spades. The Luftwaffe and the, and the um, Navy don't really coordinate their attacks. Um, that there's no real coordination across services or even between services. That the, the Germans are interesting. The Len Dayton's theory works fine in reverse. The Germans are bombing the convoys to pull the British out because they know that these things are important, and they know that if the if the if they bomb them, the British will have to come out and fight in the air over them, um, which they duly do. Um, but it doesn't really. You know, you, I, I'm not an expert on the Battle of Britain, but I think everybody knows that story about. The, the, the Germans kind of just changed their targets relentlessly. Yeah. We're going to go for ships. No, we're going to go for radar. No, we're going to go for airfield. So they, they, they probably could have done some good doing that, but they don't stick with it long enough. Um, the, the magnetic mining offensive is the really, nobody's done the calculations there. But, you know, that would they should have sat on that, mass produced them, and, and then swamped British estuaries in the following winter of 40 to 41. It would have been absolutely devastating because they would have had enough mines to close down coastal shipping quite some time so so no there's there's no structure called in if they'd have more e-boats um coastal shipping is always the cinderella service it's always under protected and they could have done a lot more damage actually they do well, that's what i was thinking we, we, you know given that the you know the limited space these convoys are operating in they kind yeah. of know where they're going to be they've got the the, the combined 
potential of e-boats, Luftwaffe, Mike. Yeah. There's, there's a lot they could, if they had got their act together, they can bring together a very coordinated campaign against this. And, you know, I'm not, I don't like doing those kind of counterfactual things, but from what you're That's saying, true. if they yeah. come together, they could have crippled us. They could have crippled they the British. They could have done. And, and as with the e-boats in the Atlantic, it would have been this, through to 41, they still had that opportunity the coast is under resourced until 41 and then it starts to change a bit and then you know then you start to get all the things that impact everything else in the war about mass production and you yeah. know american and destroyer escorts and blah blah blah, blah. It, it gets very difficult for them then but in this early stage just with the assets that they actually have if they have more of them and that i think probably if you if you're a german which i'm clearly not but i think it, it the frustration for a german naval officer would have been actually you're not talking about battleships here. You're talking about quite cheap assets, yeah, relatively small, easy to man. You know, you're talking about the kind of Stuka squadrons that they they put in the Mediterranean later that were more anti-shipping specialists. You're talking about more e-boats. Um, you know, you're talking about the small German equivalents to these, really, what they call the torpedo boats. They could have been used far more aggressively. They were a bit in the first winter, but after that they weren't. If they'd really focused on coastal trade, it could have been devastating. I'm not sure they had, and I haven't done the work, I have to say, but I'm not sure they had the understanding of just how important it was, um, you know, that the cargoes were. I think that, mm. that may well have been a factor. I did look at the, there's a sort of unofficial German official history, which I did look at, and I didn't get anything from that. That, that other than seeing these things as a targets and a handy way of engaging the British, I'm not sure that they saw them as the strategic resource that they actually were. And I think that's an impact. But yeah. I think the politics... I mean, it's few, the basically. They could, we can be grateful they didn't. You know, I mean, yeah, you know, we, we because... know by 41, the Germans are fighting on lots of fronts, lots of theatres, lots of things yeah, yeah. going on there. And But this, as you said, there, it's not pie-in-the-sky stuff. It's not like when people say... If the Germans had got the Messerschmitt 262 a year earlier, well, that was it's never going to happen. That, no. it's, that's, a, that's a silly thing. You know, it's like saying if they'd had Lewis guns at Walsh Yeah, if they something. got their aircraft carrier to sea or built a battle fleet. It's, it's not yeah. like that. This is but just a about... few more Stukas and a few more yeah. E-boats is, is, is really within their grasp. Yeah. And, and actually even more so the Ju-88 squadrons, which are devastating yeah. against shipping in the Mediterranean and in the Arctic. Um, you know, just a, a couple of Ju-88 squadrons would have been with a specialist role to interdict shipping. Again, in this early period when when it, they're harder to stop, um, so so coordinating the assets that they did have and just increasing the numbers a bit, I think would have been you know it could have been really devastating actually. And and, and yeah, I'll let you get carry on talking, but that's the thing that although you know we kind of laughingly talked about the 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 not ineptitude but the the hob the cobble together way the British began the war. Our learning curve is on the rise and keeps rising. Yeah, that's the thing is we, yeah. we, we being the collective allies, we identify what the problems are and slowly but surely we, we, we amend them and improve them and everything that was not working starts working better. It does seem to me that the Axis does tend to keep repeating the same mistakes much more than we do. And that there is a, a profound misunderstanding of the sea and sea power and how to use the sea and how the other side might use the sea in certainly the German armed forces. Um, step aside, Admiral Dönitz. Dönitz gets it, but he's focused yeah. on the Atlantic. This isn't his fight. Um, Adolf Hitler absolutely doesn't get it. And I think we always overlook just, just how much the personal influence of Hitler in any decision, even down to mm. the kind of the micro decisions uh, are made by him. Hitler never resources the Navy nor does Hitler grip Goring and tell him to cooperate with the Navy. So, you know, th those things start at the very top. So I, th I think there is a, a genuine lack of understanding about how dependent Britain is on the sea. That's the same reason, and this is a massive aside, but the same thing that drives them to build a battle fleet in the run-up to the First World War, because they don't understand that that's an existential threat to Britain. They just think it's great power trade-off stuff. Yeah. But it's not that. It is for Germany. Germany can have a fleet or not have a fleet. It doesn't really matter. Britain is dead without its fleet and its empire. And in the same way, they don't understand here that actually, you know, these little ships, are, are, the, the British economy is running on these coasters. Part of it is. Yeah. I mean, we could go on a whole, a whole rabbit hole here yeah, about yeah. the Italians and their their 
they're more mastery of the sea because I'm they're not saying, they're not an island nation but they're surrounded by yeah. a coast and, and the show yeah. we did this morning about the indian navy johnson was explaining yeah that india had a, like a, a thousand and a one and a half thousand year maritime history before you even get to world war ii they un, they understand the sea it's a, it's a sort of banal yeah. statement to make but hitler austrian you know probably he hadn't seen it. it for the first x years of his it. life so and he it's, confessed it's, that he was frightened of it yeah uh, well, um, I'll hand it back to you. This is it, we're we're going into some really kind of philosophical yeah, things about stuff. about we'll, island nation spirit now, but it's fantastic <laughs> we'll stuff. We we'll have to do some more, Paul. We we'll have to do some more, right? Um, what else comes in? These come in. These are less successful. These are Fairmile B motor launches, um, sort of maids of all work. Superficially looks like an Ebo. It's not an Ebo. It's too slow. It's too flimsy. Um, they're great little boats to do all sorts of things with, but chasing e-boats is not one of them. Um, so these get attached to convoys, um, along with um, some even more ghastly boats called motor anti-submarine boats, which are kind of early iterations of motor gunboats. Um, these are not up to dueling with e-boats. Um, they can't keep up with them for a start. And in fact, you can see on, if you look at the stern, there's depth charges raised on there. They're better at that. They're quite good at kind of anti-submarine patrol, air sea rescue, um, all sorts of things they're really good at, but not coastal convoy escorts. Um, and in this seesaw war, you then get some interesting new threats coming in. So um, this happens one day as a channel convoy goes through the Straits of Dover. There's a huge boom and a massive shell goes off. Um, the town of Dover is very used to this. Um, this is the point where the Germans introduce coastal gun batteries at Cap Green A, monstrous great guns, large caliber naval guns, um, which they spend part of the time shooting at Dover and they spend part of the time shooting at every convoy that comes through the Straits of Dover. Um, the story of the, um, of the channel guns is really interesting though, because um, I went through every single convoy. Um, when I wrote the book, there, um, Every ship that was lost in convoy had to, um, the senior survivor was interviewed by the Admiralty and they asked them a series of stock questions um, about, you know, were they camouflaged, were they zigzagging, blah, 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 blah. So I went through all of these for every single coastal convoy to look at the lost ships. Um, and I did not find a single ship that was even hit by a channel gun until 1944 when a convoy went through on the run up to D-Day and one of them was hit. Um, and nothing was sunk by them. Um, it, they're very hard to hit. The trajectories are difficult. Um, what they're ranging on, ironically, is the barrage balloons. The Germans learned that they can range on the barrage balloons, which stick handily up above the cliffs. Um, but what it is, and the analogy that I used in the book is, it's similar to snipers. It doesn't matter that they don't hit anything. The anticipation is absolutely awful because everybody knows they're on these little slow ships. And as you go through the Straits of Dover, someone's going to shoot at you with an 11-inch shell. And it's it's absolutely catastrophic for morale. It's kind of like the last mm. straw. And I'm just going to – I've got one more quote that I just wanted to read because it's so interesting. It's it's They're, they're at breaking point at this point. So this is, um, this is from a chap called Eakins from the Ministry of Shipping who does a ride-along on a coaster called the Polgarth. Um, um, in CW11, they get attacked by aircraft. There's a pretty devastating um, air attack. But then um, then they go through, um, and Eakins describes the crew. The crew of the Polgarath was a scratch crew picked up at Blythe, and I was told by the master that the deck hands were very raw. Some of them had no experience on deck before. The regular crew of the ship refused to sail on the convoy and left the ship at Blythe. Every member of the crew to whom I spoke told me that he would not sail in the convoy again. Their general attitude was that they would be prepared to sail if the cargo carried by the ships of the convoy was of vital importance to the national effort, but they would not sail if the ships were merely carrying cargoes of household coal, which can be sent by other routes. I found it very difficult to find an answer to this complaint, if indeed there is an answer. And Eakins then went on to conclude that the fear of shelling from the French coast seem to be the dominant factor in creating the crew's dislike for this convoy. So what do we learn from that? We've really got to forgive Len Dayton, haven't we? Because we've learned that even the crews on the ships had not been inducted into the importance of the strategic cargo they were carrying. They didn't know. Mm. They think they're carrying housewives' coal to keep their kitchens warm in London. 
um, and, 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 and it can be carried by other routes, both of which are completely wrong. So there's a, a total failure of, of how they um, explain to these people their importance to the war effort. And that does start to change. That gets better um, in 42, uh, well, 41, 42, really. On the plus side, this is quite fun. Um, there's one of the coastal guns. This happens in August 1940. That's a wreckage of a Heinkel 115. It's shot down and it crashes on the deck of a coaster called the Highlander, which is able to take it back as evidence that they have, to my knowledge, um, provided the only known kill to a Holman projector because they put a hand grenade through the cockpit, which blew up in the cockpit, and they shot it down and it conveniently crashed on the deck. So um, things are going well against the Luftwaffe. The Luftwaffe, of course, in 1941 stops being a problem because in June 41, the war spreads to Russia. And although the entire Luftwaffe doesn't go out east, uh, a lot of the bomber force goes either there or it goes to the Arctic or it goes to the Mediterranean. Um, and fighters are of limited, you know, fighters aren't really anti-convoy weapons. So air attack becomes, you still get tip and run raids. You get individual aircraft. They're still a pain in the neck. But you don't get those massed attacks by dive bombers. It, that becomes less of a problem. What becomes the problem for the duration of the next two years is the e-boats, um, which really start to mainly operate out of Holland. They do occasionally slip through the channel and operate out of French ports for a while. And they are focusing on that stretch of coast around the East Anglian bulge, which becomes nicknamed e-boat alley. Mm. Um, they are, they have a pretty finely honed method of operation, the e-boats. They're very aware that they aren't, there aren't enough of them, that they're commanding a valuable asset. They're under strict orders not to engage um, British warships. Um, so there's lots of kind of disparaging stuff around e-boat skippers running away and all this kind of stuff. They're, they're, they're not running away. They're doing their job. Um, their job is to, is to take down trade. Um, they would come over in the dark. Um, so they tended to be more dangerous in winter than in summer when you have the long nights. A favourite technique was to, um, uh, as, as Allied warships or British warships were starting to get radar, they would tie up to the buoys which marked the war channel. So um, they, they couldn't be distinguished on radar and they'd just wait there in silence until the convoy went past. Um, and then they'd rev up their engines, they'd go into the convoy, they'd fire their torpedoes and they'd get the hell out of Dodge before anyone could catch them. Um, because they don't have the numbers... As with the Atlantic, there's an awful lot of convoys that pass relatively unscathed, but then you'd have kind of one single devastating attack where there's very little that they can do. Um, even the destroyers, they just they, they can't traverse the weapons fast enough to hit an e-boat moving at pace. Um, they're very, very small targets. They're very, very fast. Um, they paint them white, which makes them very hard to, to see at night. Searchlights reflect off them. They're, they're very, very, very potent warships. Um, they try a lot of modifications. Um, one of the things they do is they find that um, on the uh, escort destroyers like the Hunts, the e-boats would come in so close they couldn't depress the main armament to fire on them. So they stuck mm. a two-pounder quick fire right up in the forecastle in the forepeak as far as you can go to depress down and fire over their own bows. Um, they start to introduce um, better tactics is the real key to defeating e-boats. So later in the war, you get um, aircraft, um, once you've got um, air-to-surface radar that actually can function against the sort of stuff you're putting in to detect a U-boat, periscope will detect an E-boat. So that becomes a, a real threat later on to them. But um, the first real um, adversary they face is coastal forces. And although boat for boat, the Royal Navy's coastal forces can't really cope with an E-boat, the Royal Navy are building coastal forces craft in vastly greater numbers than the Germans are. They still can't catch them when they come over. They don't really know what ultra, as far as I know, has never never really revealed anything significant around e-boat operations. I think because it's so small scale. Um, so they come over in the dark on their own. They tie up to boys. That's when it gets really interesting, though, because what they learn is that the Achilles heel of the e-boats is still their radio traffic. And what they do is as soon as they're in action and they fired those engines up, then you get a phenomenal amount of short range radio traffic. And the skippers will literally talk to each other by name. It's kind of hands, I'm over here, Fritz, I'm over here, we're going here. Um, and they, um, the, the Allies, the British start to use that. So they will put um, what were nicknamed headache operators uh, from the wire service. These are wireless intercept personnel on the on the escorts. Um, they will be listening into the German radio traffic. 
And there's at least one occasion that I came across where the, the headache operator picked up a German skipper who was lining up his Evo on their destroyer as and the, the operator was listening to them do it in real time. Um, and what that then allows them to do is they put in place what they call Z patrols, which are patrols of coastal forces, motor gunboats, and they are sitting on the other side, basically between the Germans and their home base. And the, the tactic that they come up with is we can't get them on the way in and they will do some damage, but they were very aware of how few of these assets the Germans had. So let's try and engage them on the way back when we know where they are and we know where they're going and we can catch them. Uh, and there are some successes around that, but it's still, it's in the 19th of November, 1941, before they sink an e-boat. Um, and they, they shoot it up in a, in a channeling, in a North Sea engagement. Um, they almost are able to capture it. The crew abandon. Um, it's left wallowing. There are some photos of it coming back under the boat ensign, riddled, absolutely riddled with holes. And then it sinks on the way back. Um, so they, they're starting to get the measure of the e-boats, but it's still, it's still very much... The, the e -boat, in the e-boat's favour at this stage. This is when the Thames Estuary forts appear, these wonderful things, the Army and Navy forts in, in the Thames Estuary, um, partially anti-aircraft, but also partially anti-e-boat. That's partly what these things are there to do. Um, so again, just creating obstacles, just making it more and more difficult for, for the e-boats to operate safely. Um, and the other thing you get... Finally, um, as you get into 42, 43, they start to, to sink them. Um, and again, S-71 knocks out in February 1943. Every loss of an Evo is a catastrophe for the Germans. They just don't have enough of the things and they're not building them very fast and the, the manufacturers are not getting the resources. So they do start to, um, they start to wear them away, but they very, they never actually go away. The e-boats remain a threat, certainly in the North Sea, right through to the end of the war. Um, it gets more sporadic. They start to struggle for fuel supplies and all the other things that Germans start to struggle for. But there are still e-boats in Holland, actually, in, in ports that have been bypassed by the Allies that, that come across and surrender at the end of the war uh, because they're still operating out of there. Um, they get a new lease of life um, in the Scheldt when, when the Allies have opened up Antwerp. So the, mm. the, the kind of close, close operations. So um, when I conceived this, I, I kind of took this talk through it's about halfway through the story, really. So I'm I'm going to wind down a little bit um, and just canter through very quickly the, the second half of the war, which is equally interesting, but quite different. And you can come back and expand on it in the future. If you want. We, we, can do a, we can do a taster now, and then you can just book okay. yourself a slot in the future and come back and expand on it. There, job we'll, done, sorted. We'll do it in the questions as well, if anybody's got any. Um, D-Day is the next big change really around how the convoy system works and how the network works, um, because what you've then got is, is you, you factor in convoys across to the invasion beaches and, and it becomes part of that big D-Day logistics package. Um, in the build up to D-Day, you start to get invasion traffic running down the East Coast. So you get bits of Mulberry Harbour and you know bigger ships start to creep back in as the air threat recedes. Um, you get some interesting stuff in the last year of the war. Um, you get U-boats for a start, which have basically disappeared since 1939-40. Um, you get the, the inshore U-boat campaign, um, which is is not devastating, but it's a pain in the neck. They, 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 they hide behind wrecks. They're very difficult to find. They're not just going after coastal shipping. They're going after anything they can shoot at and get away quickly. Um, but the, um, if you've done stuff on the on the Battle of the Atlantic and everybody knows about the, the Type 21s and the Type 23s, the electro boats that are coming in at the end of the war that just don't come in fast enough, the Type 23s, the little tiny coastal boats, they're designed to swarm around British coast and be a, a real pain to coastal shipping. They only carry two torpedoes. The idea is they can go to the North Sea, sink something and go home again. <clears throat> um, in the aftermath of D-Day and then later in the Scheldt, you get the um, interesting but fairly useless threat from the, the what the Germans call the Kleinkampfverbander, small battle units. So these are um, human torpedoes, miniature submarines, explosive motorboats um, by ages with about a week's training. Um, they have a so small numbers of successes, but the losses to the crews absolutely horrific. Um, and then you get different forms of mining. So you've already had in between in between the um, the magnetic mine and now the Germans introduced acoustic mines. 
So they've come in um, a little bit earlier in the war and they um, respond to the sound of a, of a ship's engine. And that that um, that generates a whole new lashed up method of mine sweeping, because what they do with that is they introduce a thing called a Kango hammer, which is basically a road drill. Um, they put a steel plate in the bows of a minesweeper and they have a jackhammer beating against it. And that triggers off um, acoustic mines. So more Heath Robinson stuff. In the Normandy invasion area and in the Scheldt, they introduced pressure mines, nicknamed oyster mines, and those are absolutely devastating. They, they, there is no known method of sweeping them. Um, they respond to the change in water pressure caused by a passing ship, and the only method of dealing with them is to steam around very slowly, which is what people end up doing. Um, the only thing really that saves the allies from those is is the luftwaffe is pretty much a busted flush at this stage so they, mm -hmm. they can never really drop them in the numbers and they don't have enough of the mines but they're, they're tremendously difficult and they take their toll of coasters as much as they do anything else but it is coming to the end now um as i said the threat continues 7th of may 1945 the last two ships were sunk um and then i am going to give you just one little quote because on the 8th of may the war ends um I did come across a lovely little story um, in 1946, I think. Where did we go? Somebody went off on a mine in 1946 driving a coaster because he um, because they, it was still a difficult area to be. Um, but this mainly is um, this is from a guy called Jack Yateman. He was in the Royal Naval Patrol Service and he served on the trawler Pearl. Um, his account is on the BBC History website, uh, BBC People's War website, if you're interested. And he wrote, these coastal convoys have slipped through the net of history, yet they were absolutely vital to the survival of the nation and later the invasion of Europe. For just one thing, the London River power stations were all fueled by Welsh coal, which had to be brought round daily without interruption. And the Mulberry Harbour and the great flocks of landing craft for D-Day didn't just spring up in the Solent. We brought them there. So that's Jack. I'm giving wow. him the last word. <laughs> yeah, the, the wonderful way to kind of bring the presentation. We'll um, we'll do a couple of questions and then we'll be. So Gary Peterson is asking, were the trawlers from the RNPS quickly reverted back to fishing trawlers after the war, so the skippers could get back to fishing? Uh, yes, and and you've, it kind of links to a really interesting question as well. That you know, how many trawlers do you take? Because we still need food, and fishing is still. Um, is still important. It, it becomes less viable because when the gloves come off early in the war and the Germans start sinking trawlers, then you can't fish the North Sea fishing grounds. Um, so that they start to sweep up more of them. But yeah, they return them to fishing, you know, those that aren't lost and an awful lot of trawlers are sunk. Um, but th those that aren't lost um, are returned to fishing as, as soon as possible. The Admiralty trawlers tended to be worn out. Some of those were sold off. But yeah, they, 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 as with anything else with the Navy, it's such an expensive thing to build up this fleet. You need to civilianize as soon as possible, and that's what they do. Super. And I think I know the answer to this one, but uh, from Caractacus, at what point, if ever, did the Luftwaffe take a dedicated coastal anti-shipping role seriously, e.g. dedicated aircraft types, training weapons? Yeah, so this is this is your Mediterranean. This is um, 10th Flieger Corps, which is the... Um, is the, the the unit of the Luftwaffe that sort of rotates between the Arctic and the Mediterranean, and they are very very good at anti shipping work. And they are they are the nearest. The, the Luftwaffe is funny. It's not that they're never allowed to specialize in the way that the coastal command squadrons really literally only did that. But Tenth Flieger Corps is very very good at what it does, and they are very good at hitting ships. And the Stuka pilots get very good at it. You know they they. Um, they learn how to do it, but it's a skill that they haven't trained for and they have to learn on the job. So the, the shipping specialists, it, they, they're never really deployed against the coast. They're deployed in, in the Mediterranean and they're deployed in, in against the Arctic convoys with, with quite a lot of effect. And that's the kind of that, that general idea that, that the Allies are transferring our knowledge base around, whereas the Germans on, can be very good in one area or something, but don't. It's a, it's a sweeping generalization. People say you're, you're not being you're not being clear enough, Woody. But yes, they're not sharing their 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 learning curve around as perhaps as well as the Allies are. Um, no, they're not, and it it also speaks to that. You know, the, the Luftwaffe High Command, as personified by Dernit, uh, by by Goering, does not see anti shipping as as the most important job of the yeah. Luftwaffe. Yeah, furthering the political career of Hermann Goering is the most important job of the Luftwaffe. 
Yeah, and and wearing other types of clothes. Anyway, we go, well, we won't go down that path. But, um, um, John York, uh, were cargoes distributed to smaller, often now defunct ports? Uh, we tend to think of modern key ports, except you know, Felix Stowe. So was there a, yeah. a, you know, a changing of which ports were used? Depending that on is what a the really situation? great question that allows me to jump into something that I didn't have time to do in the talk, but it is covered in the book. Um, so what they what gets really complex is how do you get those cargoes from the um, the oceanic shipping that after the summer of 1944 is only really going to the west coast? Those cargoes still have to be brought to places on the east coast. So they they introduce what are called war emergency ports in places like Scottish Locks, um, and they literally transship to coasters there. So the cargoes, where, where they're needed on, on the East Coast, the cargoes are taken out of ocean-going ships, which are very valuable hulls, and they're put into coasters, which are perceived as a bit more expendable, and then they go and do the coastal convoy route, and they go in and out of every single small port that you can possibly imagine on the East and South Coast. You know, they're in and out of all of them, um, and you'd, you'd have a big 50, 60 ship convoy coming down, 4th South FS convoy coming down to the, the South Coast, um, they would offload ships, so one or two of them might go into Felixstowe, a couple might button off and go into Harwich, you might get a couple coming in. Um, so they, they're constantly changing all the time. And again, you imagine, one shouldn't get into these sort of competitions, but I actually think that the, the job of, of shepherding those coastal convoys with all that going on, plus you've got a two-column convoy that stretches for miles and miles and miles and miles, I think that's a harder job than taking a nice close box Atlantic convoy over that basically forms up and stays the same between Liverpool and Halifax, Nova Scotia. Um, I, I think it's in seamanship terms, it's more complicated. And also the, the navigational challenges of operating close to the coast are really, really tricky. And there's a famous incident, um, Haysborough Sands. If you Google Haysborough Sands disaster, that is, I can't remember if it's a northbound or a southbound convoy. Um, one of the trawlers takes a wrong turn and five of the merchant ships in convoy follow it onto the sandbanks and they're all lost. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, you know, it's really tricky navigationally. Um, the, the coastal skippers used to navigate by just using landmarks on land. You know, they didn't really use charts. Um, they just stayed out in the deep water and used the landmarks. You can't stay out in the deep water because the deep water is mined and then it's German infested. So they're steaming much, much closer to shore than they usually do. Uh, they usually only use a chart to get into port. Um, and all those landmarks, you know, everything's blacked out. The lighthouses are shut down. They, they, they can't. It's really hard to navigate. So it's a real big challenge. Super. And um, we'll make this the last question. Um, and it's from Stephen Fisher, who he's currently holding a record of the, I think, the most pop about the most popular show so far this year. The uh, great one on the beach obstacles on D-Day is, is proving to be very successful. Um, but Stephen Fisher, did the adjustments made to bulk cargo sailings during the war leave any legacy in the post-war years, use of ports, timetables, cargo that stopped being moved by sea, etc.? I, I, I rely on Steve Fisher to finish up with a question that I struggle to answer. <laughs> Um, I, I can't say I've done the research in detail on that. I think that the, the issue with the the pure coastal cargoes is, as I said at the beginning, they're, they're cargoes that can't be moved by any other method than sea, really. So you don't really, and, and you've got so much, it, it's, it's an artificial economy because you've got all this military traffic moving around on roads and railways, so you can't, you can't have that option. Um, the bulk cargoes go back to being moved by sea. I don't know the answer to, you know, they the, the, the continue to move them by sea until we stop using them. So they're still moving coal around mm -hmm. by colliers and then, from, you know, from the port, then by railway if you need to get it inland. Um, I don't know the answer to whether any ports became more significant as a result of the war and then stayed more significant. Harwich um, gains quite a lot of significance as a, as a coastal escort naval base that, you know, then kind of drops away again after the war so that there's naval presence in these places that that is immediately wound down after the war it's a purely a wartime expedient but i don't know about post-war commerce unfortunately mm. so you, you caught me out again steve sorry about that well never mind i mean and, and i'm just thinking that you know we talked about at the beginning that this being a 
a, a, a story that should be better known. And I'm just thinking, having grown up on the East Coast, just how much there is there to do with the defence of Britain. Generally speaking, I'm thinking of Langard Fort, all those places I grew up with. You know, it's a, it's an area of that seems to have dropped away uh, in, in our understanding, and it's 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 a shame. Um, there, there's there's a big story here, and that what these the, these convoys achieved is. Is, is just as important as as um, the, the siege of Tobruk or whatever other comparison you want to it make is, it. It is really, and it, and I think if if nothing else, it proves that, that that we have a tendency, and I think as historians we can be a bit prone to this as well to to take things and um, you know we we just treat them in isolation, and we fail to understand that if nothing else, the Second World War in particular is a big picture, and everything is interrelated. So you can't just, and I've tried not to do it with coastal convoys, but I'm, I'm sure I probably fell into the trap as, as much as anyone else. You, you can't just look at this story because actually it has links into D-Day and it has links into the Atlantic convoys and it has links into the Battle of Britain and the home front. All these things are tied together. It's one big joined up complex thing, which is one of the things that makes it magical and exciting and almost limitless to study. But it's also quite hard to get right because you, you don't want to mission creep out into telling a story that, the Battle of the Atlantic, when you're writing about coastal convoys, but you have to show that these things are interdependent. Well, that's one of the reasons you kind of you kind of plugged what I do here on the channel in a sense. In the <laughs> books, you know, you you have to put a book in a certain shelf. You know, you, you, do I put that? You know, if it's an admiral's biography, do I put it with biographies of, 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 of leaders? Do I do put it in with the shipping ones? And and that, you know, a channel like this and Brad from on this day in Canadian military is watching is it's much more of a sort of a spider's web of directions. You can just kind of mention and go off down a tangent that a book doesn't allow you that freedom to cut. Otherwise, every book would be a, no, every book would be a Peter Caddick Adams 800 page tome <laughs> yes. of it being rabbit holes. Um, yeah, but yeah. rabbit holes are yeah. fascinating. That's the thing is it is the it is the bigger picture. It's the wider context. It's the it's the, the, the when I one of my revelations is kind of now. The realizing that the New Guinea campaign to Australians is to the Americans what the Guadalcanal camp campaign is, but yeah, yeah. It's true. you have to study the two together, and we haven't. We've been looking at these things kind of nationalistically or topic by topic. So people write about naval history, but they don't talk about the the the, the air war or whatever it would be. And it's it's always about bringing all these. It's just spinning plates, isn't it? It's keeping all these plates spinning. It is indeed. Yeah. It's been great well, fun. Really enjoyed it and really enjoyed all the questions as well. It's been really Brilliant. Good. Well, I'll just remind people what got coming up and I'll come back and say goodbye in a second. So, folks, tomorrow's show is a bit earlier. So Julia Jones is coming on to talk about the yachtsman volunteers who ended up serving their country on various ships and vessels. So that's quite exciting. If you know Julia Jones's name, big history with maritime magazines and yachting and things like that. So she's coming on to talk about that. So it's 6 p.m. GMT. And uh, so just note that time there. I know, of course, the USA have done their uh, summer uh, uh, hour clock change thing. So I know it means timings are a bit weird. Once Britain and France changes the end of this month, we go back to normal time for the summer. But it is a bit weird now because America's changed and we haven't. So just keep an eye on the timings is what I'm saying. If you are new to the channel, please don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like the shows you're, you're watching. Comment as well during the show and also afterwards. And as I said at the beginning, the link to Nick's book is in the description below. And again, a particular hearty thank you for coming in with about 36 hours notice to do this show. Because that's uh, it, well, he kind of got me out of a hole there. So, well, thank you very much, Nick. Very and well, I you. just said you enjoyed it. So that was great. So there we are. This is Paul Woodard for World War II TV saying I will see you all again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Cheers, thanks. Bye.